thank you all for showing up today. It means a lot to all the families in New Hampshire and across the state uh, and across the country. Um, I really appreciate this movement. And uh, Jenny Sandler is going to lead us off in song. So many people. Yeah. That's good. We're all here for a good reason. That was fast. Good job. <laughs> Good morning, dear friends, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Happy to be here with you today. It brings me a lot of joy to see everyone here standing up, raising our voices. It's nice to start with a song. Singing can be a way both of nourishing ourselves it's like giving ourselves an inner massage, but also of solidarity, of supporting our community. So I encourage you to take some deep breaths. Feel your feet. Look around. See who's here with you. See that we are not alone. Upon immigrants 
and refugees. But this is not the end of it. These are white supremacist, nationalistic views that they're gonna go down the road and like the poem says, first they came from the Jews, but they're gonna go and get every single one of us. So we're here to say loud and clear, send a message loud and clear that we're not going to stand for this. We're also here to tell Congress to stop bowing down to Trump and funding everything and to really do their job and represent the will of the people. We need to tell Congress to step up, not bow down. Yes. Yes. And they take our vote for granted, and if they keep taking our vote for granted, then we have to get them out and get people elected that really represent the values of our nation. Right. Yeah. Right. We're supposed to be one nation, indivisible. And that, all they have done is create discord and, and separate people and classify people. We're not going to allow that. So here we are to say never again. So repeat after me, never again is now. 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 And we're going to keep yelling and screaming, this is the first of many actions because we're in it for the long run. That's right. Well, this yeah. is not a one-time event. And the next time we're going to do, do it in front of our darling governor too, because everybody's going to have to pay attention to us. That's right. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing my body, champion of immigrant rights, attorney, Ron Abramson. Where are you, Ronnie? <laughs> All right, so I don't have a, a podium or a soapbox, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so I think as a Jewish, Latino, immigrant, immigration lawyer, they asked me to kick this off because I checked most of the boxes. So we got, we got that going. But I'm going to start with a, a quote I found getting ready for this from Lord Acton, who wrote this in the 18th century. Opinions alter, manners change, creeds rise and fall, but the moral law is written on the tablets of eternity. So that's what I'm going to focus on. And while I am extremely grateful for all of you being here today, I'm also sad and not even a little bit angry, a lot angry, to be standing before you today. I stood on those steps just over a year ago and I implored anyone who would listen to stop harming children in pursuit of tougher immigration enforcement. Yet the situation has only grown worse. The stories more heartbreaking. The cruelty and details more vile. As we stand together here today, our nation is in crisis. Our environment is in crisis. Our infrastructure is in crisis. Our educational system is in crisis. Our ability to achieve the American dream is in crisis. Only 27 more pages to go, hang in there. But of all the crises facing us, none feels more unnecessary, more pointless, and more cruel than the crisis we've created and are now facing at the southern border. I came to this country as an immigrant when I was two years old. It wasn't my choice, but my parents had enough education and privilege that they were able to move here legally without much fear of persecution, marginalization, or certainly of our family being separated. Different time, different circumstances, and I could be one of the unshowered, toothbrushless, underfed, petrified children shivering night after night on a concrete floor. As a Chilean immigrant Jew, I've always been aware of being a little different. You might even notice that today. And those blended cultural sensibilities formed my worldview, which is that we're all basically here to help each other in any way we can. I've practiced law now for over half my life. Hard to believe. 26 years, and I've focused on 
leveling the playing field between the mighty force of government and the interest of vulnerable individuals. So let's talk about the law. Law is supposed to be a codification of our collective morality. It's supposed to provide a framework for our harmonious coexistence. The law confers rights and it limits government action. The law is not supposed to be a weapon. It should not be an instrument of aggression and should never provide the means to impose sadism on the most vulnerable. When fulfilling its highest purpose, the law is meant to be a shield, a protector. The law is supposed to be clear and consistent while also allowing for care and compassion on a case-by-case -case basis. But, in recent years in America, we've seen a bastardization of the law. We're seeing hyper-focused immigration enforcement, including unsurprisingly targeted raids around the country on this very day. The current administration favors two alternate approaches to the law, implementing it strictly and severely and without merciful discretion so as to cause maximal damage, or ignoring it completely without fear of meaningful accountability. Such an approach to the law is not a sign of strength. It's a constant reminder of weakness and insecurity. Every day, I'm privileged to work with and for people who seek essentially what we all seek. Physical safety, good health, stability, opportunity for themselves, even greater opportunity for their children. My clients are our neighbors, our colleagues, our fellow congregants, our local businesses, our friends, and their children. We see the fear and fatigue in parents' eyes. We witness the skeptical distrust by children who've been hurt by people who were supposed to protect them. And worst of all, we see the erosion of hope when a person believes that they have no place. Their home is uninhabitable. The place which may have offered refuge, right here, has become indescribably inhospitable. So make no mistake, while immigration policy has plentiful room for debate and disagreement, family separation and the unconscionable caging of people, of children, violates even the loosest definition of human decency. We tend to be rightfully disturbed and moved when we hear about sick or injured children. We mourn the loss of a child to disease or fatal accidents as the inexplicable tragedy that it is. As a colleague of mine, just to put it in perspective, tweeted yesterday, if you caged 384 dogs in such a space, you'd be headed to court on animal cruelty charges. which extracts political capital from cruelty, with law enforcement which has itself become unacceptably callous and cruel in discharging its mission, and with an all too significant percentage of our populace unperturbed about this easily preventable humanitarian crisis. And while it is true that the courts applying the law have served as a bit of a counterweight, the legal process is not the means by which we may quickly cure such significant policy dysfunction. So, to all of you, keep showing up, keep standing up, keep speaking up, ask the tough questions, demand better answers, and remember what Albert Camus wrote, it may seem a ridiculous idea, but the only way to fight the plague is with decency. Thank you all for bringing so much decency here today. Thank you, Ron.
wake you up. Now we have civil rights attorney, Ken Barnes.